Hey, what's up, guys? I'm Brian Drake here on the Dice Tower, taking a look at another game from Mind Clash Games today. Now, you know I love the Knacker. It was a fantastic game about worker placement, time travel, all that sort of stuff from Victor Peter. And then we looked at Tricarion, which obviously speaks to me because I'm a stage magician. It's what I do for a living. So we're taking a look today at something different. Something is a little bit more cerebral, if you will. It does something different, though. Cerebria goes inside of your head. Cerebria takes you inside of a human being. All their emotions, all their ambitions, all their wants, desires, and dreams all played out in this push and pull sort of game. And the way it works is pretty interesting. I'm gonna go through how to play the game, overview it, and what we think about it, but I just wanted to show you, first of all, just a landscape of this wonderful, beautiful art that is all over this board. So let's take a look at how Cerebri plays, how it stacks up against other games, what kind of game it really is secretly, and if it's any good. So let's take a look right now how to play. We'll come back up and talk about all that just now. So let's talk player boards first. Now, the most important concept to understand about Cerebria, it is a team game. You play it in teams of two for the base game. You can play up to six with an expansion that involves some balance figures. But the idea is it's a tug of war, push and pull, sort of area control game between the gloom slide, which would be the kind of the negative emotions we have, and the bliss side, which are things like harmony, empathy. Well, right here we have anxiety and hatred playing on this team on the gloom side. Now, Let's go through the actual basic board here, what you will do on your turn, what these actions do. Uh, again, it's a big game, a lot of concepts. I'm going to give you as much as we can overview-wise to understand uh, kind of you know how to do this as far as the game itself. So the actions you can do, it's an action selection game. There are three different, uh, you can do three actions on your turn. There are five actions over here on your player board, as well as five actions out there on the main board, which we will go through those in just a moment. Everybody on the A side shares all of these same actions. Now, for advanced players, you can kind of set up where you want these to be. Maybe you don't want the quell action available yet. You want to kind of have a more powerful version of invoke. I like that idea to have the variability of what you want to start with. Now, uh, let's just talk real quick. Move. Anything that has a little hanging down uh, arrow or a line, that is the cost. So any of these cost that one crystal willpower. And there's these beautiful crystal pieces uh, which we'll talk about when we get to the game itself, but you will play, actually I'll show you that right here. These crystal pieces are fantastic. If you played uh, Tricarion, imagine the Tricarion shards, but in this wonderful translucent purple. These are your willpower. This is your energy throughout the game, and you have another resource called um, Essence. And these Essences, they um, are all about intensifying your emotions. These are essence, these are willpower. These are basically your resources that you need during the game. So movement, you also have a figure. Now the base game comes with um, actual standees made out of cardboard, but if you had the Kickstarter, and I think they're coming out with the version to get these wonderful plastic figures, these pre-painted miniatures, you can get these as well. But uh, this is hate and anxiety here. We have them on the board, hatred. So when you move, you'll move your character basically along those lines. So you have the lines that trace spaces between spaces. So these are what's called realms spaces. These are called frontier spaces. There's a difference between the lower ones and the higher ones. They can affect certain areas and they kind of affect scoring in different ways. Now, when you move, you can move one space for, by paying a willpower, so you can move to here. Uh, if you upgraded this action, which you can see here, if you upgrade it once, which you would do by, uh, we'll talk about how you can upgrade later, but you would actually have this symbol covered. And now you can upgrade, you can spend an additional willpower to move another space. So you could move uh, two spaces out here, which would be one, two. If you wanted to upgrade it again, you could move on to an opposing character spot. If you had it upgraded one last time, it just costs one less to do the action. So a nice little thing to upgrade those actions all the way up. The next one would be Invoke. Now Invoke is how you get your cards onto the board. Everybody starts with a deck of emotion cards specific to the, uh, and you can deck build all you want, there's a lot of depth to this game, but specific to this, um, this character of anxiety, there's a deck of cards over here. And these are your emotions. They all feature the color symbol of the emotion, the name of the emotion, what the emotion can upgrade into, the emotional power that they all give, every one of them gives a power. Then these areas here, this is where you can influence this uh, emotion to kind of raise its strength. When you put it out there with the invoke action, you'll place it onto a space adjacent to your uh, spirit. So 
currently here, if anxiety is going to play this card of embarrassment, it can only from this space affect here and here. Now, if anxiety was here, they could put the card in the triad, but it would be here. You could put it in the frontier. So you could put the card there if you're on the frontier. If you're in the realm, you could put the card here. So when the card goes out, you take one of the essences off your board and you put it on the spot that's highlighted. So this now has a power of one. And the way this works is you're looking for control of the realms, control of the realms, control of the frontiers. You then calculate the points now for this realm. So the orange card is here in the frontier. Frontiers share between the two realms, but a card in the realm blocks a card in the frontier. So even if this was higher power than this card, this card is blocked because there's an emotional card here that is part of the uh, the Glooms team. So currently the strength, actually we have one here, the strength for this realm is one, two, and there would be one on there as well, two Gloom to nothing because there's nothing, there would technically be nothing showing because that is blocked by the Gloom card. Now if this was reversed, this card would not be giving any power to it. So it would actually just be one, two for this realm. So it's just an interesting concept about placement of where these cards go is important as well as the power on them. So once you control a realm, you would take one of these uh, cardboard tokens here. You would show that you have control of that realm. Like two sided. If you have control of the realm, the actions in the realms become one crystal of willpower less when you do them. So it's a way to get cheaper actions but a lot of the gold cards call for that as well. So that's what Invoke does. When you, when you upgrade it, you can pull another essence from the supply by flipping one of your ambition tokens. You can do it again by spending two crystals here uh, to do it. So you can essentially put three uh, essence out there. Now, <clears throat> one of the ways to score points on your turn, and again, it's all over the place, but it does make sense when you start playing. There are intentions down here. If you quell, which we'll talk about in a minute, if you use your refresh action to pull more willpower than four, or four more willpower off in the middle, we'll talk about that in a minute, if you completely fill an emotion card. So had they done the extra essence out here to fill this emotion card, you would score one point on your wheel of intentions, or your wheel of uh, aspirations, I think they're called. Uh, we'll cry. I can't remember the name of this, but it's your wheel where your points are calculated. For the first time you do an intention, you score one point. The second time an intention is done on your collective turns as, as a uh, team, you score two points. So the last one be fully upgrading one of your actions. So that's move, that's invoke. Let's talk about quell. Quell is how you remove. So again, Twilight Struggle, this would be how you do a coup or a uh, 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 the, the uh, influence check thing where you pull their influence off. Quelling is you spend two crystals uh, of willpower and then you flip one ambition token which is this one here. Flip one of these ambition tokens. These are shared and only one of them can come back per uh, end of round. So it's not, you don't just instantly flip all these back. So you kind of have to bide your time, decide what you're gonna do. You then have to show a color card in your hand that matches the card you're trying to quell. So if we're trying to quell this card and pull the uh, essence off of that card, I would have to have a red card in my hand. I would show it, spend the resources, and then you would pull the essence off that when the essence is removed all of it, you would remove this card. So it's a good way to get cards out of play. Then with your third action, if you wanted to, or your second action on your turn, you could go ahead and put another one down and then put the influence on there and all that sort of stuff. So quelling is how you remove your enemy's cards. Well, if you wanted to do the upgraded version, it's two crystals to uh, pull an extra essence off of it. And this one, it means you do not have to show the card. Obviously, again, the discount there. Fortify. So these things in the middle, you've probably seen that tower there. That is the tower that uh, you're trying to build to actually decide who this human being is going to be, what they're gonna be finalized in their life. You do have these pieces of plastic available to you though, sitting on your sideline until you build with them. When you fortify from the realm, you can spend three crystals of willpower to put this fortification out there. Now what this fortification does, I'll move him so you can see it here. This gives you a plus one power if you upgrade it into its better one, it's plus two power. And you put a little token there to denote that. So when you're calculating for the realm, these fortifications can actually help you take over it. And the next one down there when you upgrade would be raise. It basically means you tear down one of their fortifications. Now, the other rule is when you do this action we're gonna talk about in a minute where you flip this token over to get more willpower, if a revelation is triggered, which is the uh, scoring rounds and they happen just instantly you just finish the revelation you then you turn it over and continue your turn if that happens and it's triggered because your 
standing, the, the one that gets empty, and I'll talk about that in a minute, is in front of your fortification, you could add one of these to the tower in the middle. Towers in the middle are in-game points. It's five points for the big ones, three points for the little ones. And if you're out of it, which is one of the triggers at the end of the games, you have to put your capstone on. This is worth four points. So it's possible, but uh, not quite that easy to do it like that. These are the actions there. The last one would be empower. Empower means you basically take the emotion card and change it to its better version. So uh, jealousy would turn into envy. It's upgraded, gets a better power, and it has stronger emotions on there. These upgraded cards are in a deck right over here. Actually, I'm gonna show you. So this one is Envy, how nice. It's a better card than Jealousy. You'll notice that everything almost doubles. So it's almost. So it's one, two, three for Jealousy, but Envy is two, three, four when it comes to power. The power gets better down here too. So it's just a better way to control these realms by having these cards uh, be upgraded like that. So in the basic game, you don't actually do that, but in this one you do, and then you see the upgrades here. Uh, when you upgrade it, you can do them anywhere versus just doing it uh, in an area that's adjacent to where your spirit figure is. Most things have to do with being adjacent to your spirit figure. Now, the next thing you can do on your turn if you want to anytime is you can flip your action marker over to do this uh, absorb influence or absorb willpower. And what you do is you flip it over to show you've done it. These circles in the middle of the board are seated with seven willpower each. Now, I'm only gonna put a few out here because we're gonna show you it's possible for these to get low, and when they're lowered, that's when revelation is triggered. Revelations, again, are the scoring round. So this thing can move, too. If you want to, you can spend one of your ambition tokens to spin the origin in the center. So let's just say that my character is right here. I'm now gonna flip this over and do the absorb action. I take two as a base, and for each frontier I control around that one, it's an additional willpower. Plus, if there's any other bonuses you get from an emotion card. So this would be three, four willpower if I take it. So if I empty this, a revelation is triggered. Now revelations basically mean that you flip up your hidden agenda that you have. If you've done it, you get a small piece of plastic to put out on the tower. If you also have done the public agenda for the round, if you've won that one as well, you'll get a large piece instead to go out here so it's worth more points both teams can get small ones both teams uh, cannot obviously get big ones so it's just a way to get points added to the game and solidify your victory once you finish the revelation you'll continue with your turn this would then spin because that's what happens every time you do this action and again that moves it around but you also take a bonus from each of these so this one just would give you an emotional card the five actions on the board would be willow values you spend a willpower to have access to trade your willpower into essence. Now it's weird to say it like that, but what that means is you spend one and then you can trade as many other willpowers as you want for these essence tokens. And that's how you get them on your spirit board. Again, if you control a, a realm, you get a minus one discount. So it actually would just be a free and clear trade. This one over here is you trade in a willpower to gain four willpower. So basically it's a net of three unless you control the realm and it's a net of four. This one over here, you pay a willpower to draw the top emotion card. Again, your emotion card deck is here. The top card is always face up. You could do it again by spending two more crystals to get as many, and you can do it as many times as you want, spending two crystals to get more cards. This one over here is you spend two, you spend, I'm sorry, you spend two crystals to move a card next to your spirit guy. So if you want to move a card that's really high built up to an area that needs some help, you can move that card adjacent to you. This one is the Land of Desire. You can spend a crystal to place essence out from your board onto an emotion that's adjacent to your character. And uh, it strengthens that, obviously, that emotion. And then that's all the actions you can do on your turn. The other things you can do here would be you can flip this over to upgrade. And the way you upgrade is you check to see your cards in your hand. You flip this over, the Ambition Token, which again is shared. You discard a card with that color you want. And then you would take the symbol of upgrade and put it out here. You could never have the same color symbol in a row. So if you're upgrading movement, you could never put another yellow card discarded to it. Another thing you could do is you could spin this to flip the uh, origin once, and you can spend two of them to get an extra action. That's basically the whole game. The game triggers ending three ways by if someone has a capstone, if someone reaches 20 points, or if all of these public objectives have been scored. So nine rounds at most, uh, or nine revelations at most. That's how the game plays. It goes 
every other person it goes bliss gloom bliss gloom or you know whatever but there's a lot of variability there's a lot of setup there's a lot of things that you can change when you play this game but that's how you play cerebria let's go talk about what we think about cerebria how it stacks up what kind of a game it really is at its core so that's it that's how cerebria plays it is a big heady game lots of rules lots of symbolism lots of things to keep track of in your mind but also it's a push and pull game with a partner which is tricky because carla and i were partners and we're married we've been married for 11 years but we don't always work best together on a team because she's way smarter than me and knows what to do so there's that right but the game let's talk about what kind of a game it is first secretly and this is what i've been calling it i, I don't think you could find this on any marketing it probably didn't even enter victor's mind when he came up with this game but to me as a reviewer this is what the game felt like to me and it's good because i love the two games i'm about to compare it to three games I'm about to compare it to it felt like a very, very, very pretty version of uh, 1960, Twilight Struggle, and then 1989. You say, but Brian, those are war games. Well, this one is an influence area control game on a board in which you are placing your influence and pulling other players' influence. There's a lot more to it than, it's not card driven, it's action selection driven. So obviously you're choosing your actions from the 10 actions you can take plus the free actions you can take. You can choose three of them on your turn. And doing that really builds a lot of mystique into the game of what are we gonna do? How can we maximize? If I go here, well there's gonna be a turn in between us. Can you go there and do that? And can I say that and give you my intentions out loud without them hearing it, right? So there's a lot to do when it comes to uh, Cerebria and the tag team-ness of it. And I really like the tag team. I think that's a cool idea of doing a game where you have to play in teams because that really stretches people. A lot of times we're too busy thinking about our own strategy. But ironically, in a game that's all about the inside of one person, you're having to play as two emotions working together. Now, the comparison can come maybe as this like inside out the board game. In a sense, it leans towards that direction of you're inside someone's mind and there are emotions, there are drives, there's ambitions, but it really is nothing like inside out the movie in the sense that it's a cute Disney movie. This is intense. This is this is war for who someone is going to be. Are they going to be gloomy? Are they going to be depressed? Are they going to be happy? Are they going to be wonderfully joyful and exuberant? All that sort of stuff. So the game though, let's talk about what we love about this game first. Uh, I love the art. It is top notch. It's fantastic. Now you saw us playing with the plastic miniatures. It comes with standees which still look fantastic. You, you're, I think you're going to be able to get those plastic miniatures uh, down the line. But beautiful, beautiful game. I love the way everything looks in this. From the board to the crystals, the actual pieces themselves, the essence, the, the miniatures, the, the standees even. Uh, just the, the player boards. The fact that you get an instruction book of your own. A reference book that tells you how to... Uh, how, what all the emotion powers do. Now, Victor's always been fantastic about this when it comes to his other games with Dracarion, especially with the, the menu of tricks, right? You knew what every single trick in the game did, what it was worth, what it cost. Uh, Anachrony had a lot of great references and symbolism and things like that. Very good with this uh, reference for the team. You get this reference guide that tells you all the emotions. I love that. I think that's fantastic. Now, here's where the divide comes. I like games like Push and Pull, Twilight Struggle, sort of influencing areas. Carla does not like those games at all. So she did not like playing Cerebria. She didn't like the idea that it was kind of a mean tug of war game because that's the type of game it is. I really love that because I love the fact that it's a pretty version of those kind of games. Again, I'm not saying that entered anyone's mind, but to me, as a player, as a reviewer, that's what it felt like. Like we were taking advantage of these areas and influencing them. I like what the actions do. I like how you upgrade the actions. I like that you can mitigate um, um, not having enough actions by being smart with your willpower, by taking the absorb action. But you have to be careful which absorb action you're going to take because it might empty and turn into a revelation, which a revelation will send. Maybe it's not time. Maybe you're not ready to do the scoring for that round. You don't have your goals met. So it's really, I just, I love how this game plays. I think it's a fantastically uh, well done game. The problem is it is a team game. You have to play with people who you're going to enjoy being on their team. Uh, you can play two and three players, but the way the game is meant to be played is definitely on this team, of this, this tug-of-war team between the two of you versus two other people. Fantastic game, uh, beautiful game, but again, be warned. There are people, and indeed Carla is one of them, and then one of the other players we played with just last night, also not a fan of the, the weirdness of that, of playing in a tug-of-war team in an influence placing game. So just know that when you go into this, that's the kind of game you're getting into. It's not like Anachrony, it's not like you're carrying on a single worker placement style game. 
This is an action management, action selection game that involves you controlling areas and influencing those areas and being mean by quelling and pulling their fortifications and using all those sort of power. So just know that that's the game that you have in store. If that's right up your alley and it's up mine, I like that kind of game, definitely go check out Cerubia. It is a gorgeous game. Victor, again, does a fantastic job. Him and the team over there at, uh, at Mind Clash have done a really, really, really good job. So gorgeous game. Go check it out uh, unless it's not your type. And until then, I'm Brian Drake here on The Latest Retro on the Dice Tower. Make sure to follow me at Twitter at The Latest Retro, Instagram, all that sort of stuff. Make sure to shoot me any questions. I didn't do a question of the day for this video. Man, I forgot. But uh, we'll do question of the day when it comes to the next video. Until next time. I'll see Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews as well as our top-rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at Dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching the Dice Tower. The Dice Tower 